Hey, and welcome, guys. Uh, welcome to it's Jeff from Home Renovation. Today, we're here to talk about drywall. We're going to deal with a lot of the DIY beginner stuff, how to hang it yourself, uh, installation tips. We're going to do some common damage and how to repair it. Okay, we're going to go through a bunch of stuff and four different corner options that all have different uh, pros and cons and applications. We're going to cover all that gambit. And then we're going to do a Q&A. And so in the Q&A, it's going to be a different set of questions. I want you to say, this is the damage that I have, all right? And I'm going to go make the hole in my wall and show you how to fix that. All right, we'll talk about the science behind the repair and, and what works and what won't, okay? This is really important. So uh, we saw already that somebody's child tried to use the towel bar as a jungle gym, ripped it off the wall. Hope the kid's okay. <laughs> I didn't fall on his head or anything because, you know, kids when they're young and dumb are top heavy. Uh, let's just deal with this right out of the gate. How to hang drywall yourself. We're all in that situation sometimes, you know. Uh, we call up all our friends and say, hey, it's drywall day at the job site. You guys kind of pop by Saturday. We'll do a case of beer, hang a few sheets, have some fun. No one shows up because everybody hates drywall. That's because they don't know how to do it. If you're good with drywall, you love drywall, just like painting. If you're good with painting, you love to paint. I think drywall and paint are my two favorite things to do in the world because they don't take a lot of brain power, right? It's just a good workout. Who needs the gym? Anyway. Hey, everybody in the chat, I've got my camera up here. I've got another camera set up over here. We're gonna be able to do um, some really close up in like Zoom, like right on the hands while we're working stuff tonight, okay? We've got a lot of old drywall videos. And back in the day, we were working in um, not so favorable conditions, right? We're on a job site, never really considered lighting and directions and angle, camera angles. So today when we do the repair, we're gonna have some close up camera shots, show you the hand techniques with the tools so that you guys can mimic that and practice the skill level, right? Because knowing how to use the tools, right, is the key to success with making this an easy project. Now, um, we're gonna deal with drywall. If you got questions about plaster or making transition, repairing modern materials in old walls before building code, we can deal with all that later. Let's just jump into this first. <sighs> we got a fake wall, so we can bust the living daylights out of this thing, all right? We're gonna have some fun. First thing we gotta do when you're gonna hang drywall is realize you're gonna have a ceiling. Now, this is a fake wall, so I don't have a ceiling. So I'm just gonna measure from the top. I'm gonna measure 48 and a quarter inches. That's key, a quarter inches. I'm using a black marker so that you guys can maybe see this in a couple of different positions on this, all right? Drywall traditionally comes four feet wide. 8 foot, 10 foot, 12 foot, sometimes 16 foot long and half inch. Uh, same in 5 eighths, all right? They're all available, not on the shelf, but if you go to your local building store, you can ask for the delivery and they'll have all that inventory at the delivery site, okay? So don't be afraid to say, hey, do you carry this? In Canada, we even have 9 foot sheets, which can come in really handy. Um, the other thing is, is they do come in 54 inch wide. So if you have a 9 foot ceiling, it's two sheets of drywall. You don't have to buy the four foots and then have the extra street, little, little one foot strip in there. That's a pain in the butt to take. Once we have our two marks, okay, that represents four feet and change. We're gonna take a two by four, throw it across those two marks. This is gonna be your helping hand, all right? <clears throat> We're gonna throw a clamp on there, grab a couple of screws in our drill, and we're gonna screw this in place. This is how you work by yourself. Gotta use science, right? You don't wanna just be hauling things around, trying to hold it with one hand and drill and screw and things. It'll drive you nuts, okay? So now we can take our sheet and throw it up. I always start near the roof. Hoi! Alrighty. I always start near the top and then work your way down, all right? The goal with drywall is to close the gaps so that you have less taping to do. Every gap you have needs to be filled before you tape. Okay, so if you follow that concept and that logic, you wanna close up to the ceiling first. All right, now, a four by eight sheet of drywall is just a little under 40 pounds. And it's not a big deal for most people to handle 40 pounds. If you're buying the fire rated 5H product that's closer to 70 or so, Okay, so consider that. It is a different game. Now, I gotta change up my bit here real quick. 
Excuse me, we can play some music maybe. Da -da -da. Now, if you're using half inch drywall, you have to use a one and a quarter inch drywall screw. Building code requires your fastener to be one and a half times thicker in the wood than it is in the material you're attaching to your frame. Half inch material times one and a half plus the half inch is inch and a quarter, blah, blah, blah. Okay, one screw there. Your second screw should go as high as possible, and I'll tell you why in a second. Ugh. Did that even grab anything? That's a good question. Apparently not. There we go. Get in there, baby. I got right in between the two studs. There we go. And here's why you have to get that screw nice and tall. Inevitably, when you're working alone, you get a sheet of drywall, you throw this convenient screw in, and then your wife will call and say, can you come and give me a hand with something? So you leave, right? And then you open the door to leave the room. <laughs> you create a vacuum, pulls the sheet right off the wall. And your three-year-old sitting there watching you work gets a 40-pound sheet of drywall slammed on the top of their head. True story. It happens all the time. All righty. Now, next stop, find all your stud locations. Throw a screw in it. This is the rule. You can see them right now. This is crucial to your success. Knowing where the middle of that stud is. All right. And we have all kinds of options when it comes to drill bits. You don't have to just use a Phillips bit like this. Okay. We have dimpler bits. We have drywall screw guns. We've got all kinds of good stuff out there. This is a real basic tool, and if you're careful, you can be successful with it. All right? Now, you got an option. You can look at it. You can kind of draw a line up here, and hopefully you find a stud. <laughs> or ah, you can grab one of these bad boys. Okay? Go out laser level. All right? If you're working alone, boom, set on the ground, put in the middle of that stud. Okay? And then you'll be able to find the locations every single time. Go perpendicular, because that way you won't have a screw head hitting, okay? Let me show you a brong installation. All right, we'll go on an angle. You hear that? That clicking is me hitting the screw head. Okay, wrong, right. Always go perpendicular, straight in. Okay, if you screwed up, change the angle. Use the same hole. All right? And for good measure, if you've broken through the paper and you're not sure if you made a good contact, an inch above, an extra screw. It's perfect every time if you do that. Now, for the purpose of today's video, I'm not going to throw every bloody screw in the drywall, okay? We're going we're gonna to try to maintain our sanity just a little bit here. But I'm going to throw a couple in just so that my prop is fit for working with later on down the road. Because in a couple of weeks after I get back from my trip to Chicago, we're going to be comparing the paints to bottom end lines from Home Depot and Lowe's. We're going to do it live right here. Find out which ones I love and hate. No, one of them is not bare. I've already established that I hate bare. That is a fact, Jack. <laughs> All right. Now that we got that done. I'm going to switch back out. We're going to pull out our temporary second pair of hands. Okay. We'll get this out of the way. All righty. We're going to talk about the bottom sheet. Now, depending on the size of your room, you can buy the sheet the same width as the wall. But we're going to deal with the, the basement issue because a lot of people are doing basements and you get really long runs in your basement, right? And so you'll have insulation, maybe vapor barrier, depending on your climate zone, blah, blah, blah. But here's the thing. Your drywall, if it's not going to come... 40 feet long, like that living room wall that you want to work with. 
okay? It's not always going to be perfect. You're going to need butt joints. So we're going to talk about how to do a butt joint in this video right now. First thing you want to do is remember you're framing every 16 inches on center. If you're not familiar with that, you want to watch last week's live show where we built this thing and we showed you how to frame, how to fix your framing if you got problems. But here's the deal. If you're every 16, then your 8 and your 10 and your 12 foot will fit. Okay? You'll be okay. All right, so here's the deal. Well, your 8 and your 12 will be. Your 10s are probably better to be on 2 foot on center, but you want to come over and you want to mark your 4 foot line. Okay, right here. All right. And we're going to want to hold our knife up against our tape. All right. Ah. And draw that line. And this is the basics of how to cut drywall. I've done videos in the past where I've had a uh, T-square. All right. It's a great little gizmo. It costs about 20 bucks. You can get them at the Home Depot. It sits on top of the drywall, provides you that perfect straight line. You can cut it. While I'm down here in Florida, I'm only putting up a couple of sheets of drywall on this actual project, so I don't have a drywall square on me. But you open it like a door, you lean it back, it lifts off the ground, and then you can cut it, all right? Now, we're gonna take a look at the science of this. Let's pretend that these are both 12 feet long, all right? And you got to cut. You don't want your cut to be touching each other. The way you install this is actually inverse. Okay? Always sort your things out so that your drywall sheets are factory edge to factory edge. All right? Now, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pull this camera up nice and close. And... <laughs> okay. How's that showing, Eric? I got Eric back in Ottawa. He's going to give me a hand with this. But you see, factory edges are nice and tight. That's a good butt joint corner. Okay. So now we can take our drywall screws. Now we go back to the main camera. And I'm going to show people a trick here. Okay. Take your knife. All right. You're working by yourself. Go to the middle of the sheet. Shove it in the drywall. Whoa. Whoa. Gotta love live video. Shove it in the drywall. Now you can lift it into place. Use your knee to hold it against the wall. All right? Throw a screw underneath the other screw. And on the other side. Okay, and then you do the same thing with this one. Let's get the second camera on this. Okay, here we go. We're gonna jam the knife in there. And you might think that's reckless, but the truth of it is, We're going to be taping this anyway, right? There we go. Now, if you got access to a foot pedal, great. If you don't, that's fine too. Now, here's your butt joint. You grab a handful of screws and. We're gonna put screws side by side, all the way down, five screws for every four feet. If you go with a 54 inch, you're gonna need a six screw, okay? This is called stitching it together. Once we got that stitched together, that bad boy's basically installed, all right? And so butt joint to butt joint, put all your cuts into your inside corners, and that is how you're going to have success. I'm just going to throw a couple extra screws in here. 
because in a few seconds, I'm going to show you a few different corner options. Some of these you've seen, some of them you haven't seen, or you've seen them installed wrong. <laughs> Let's get my camera out of the way before I destroy it. All right. Now, we've got it installed now. This represents your drywall. You need to have one, two, three, four, five screws, every stud for a standard installation, okay? If you're doing anything and you're getting your building inspected, before you can mud and tape in, let's say you're doing a secondary suite in the basement, you're going to get a fire code inspection. Your fire code inspection is gonna require that the labeling on the drywall says type X. They're gonna require that they see the right number of screws in your drywall. All these things before you're even allowed to put on mud. All right, very important. Now, if you're doing anything on your residential property, you don't have to be quite as picky, but good practice is good practice, okay? Okay, um, in this particular case, my wall is bigger than normal. <laughs> so if you are in a normal building construction situation, the total gap on a new construction wall leaves four foot, four foot, and then about a half inch on the bottom. All right, so you can get one of those foot pedals if it works for you. You can use that as well. That's another great tool. Now, we're gonna do a couple of other quick little installs. I've got some drywall cut. We're gonna show you a couple of different things because I've got four different um, corners for you, okay? And this is really cool. So let's just go set this camera up here. All right. Now, there we go, Eric. So on this side, okay, on this side, we're gonna use our vinyl corners. Now, there's two types of vinyl corners. One vinyl corner is a rounded corner. And I'm gonna show you the difference because the drywall actually is installed different for this type of corner beat, okay? Now, I'm just gonna grab, oh, it's in behind. I'm so organized, I scare myself. <laughs> this is the rounded corner right here, okay? It's called a bull nose drywall corner. And the way you install it is up here. The drywall, you actually, you cut the drywall so it stops right on the outside of the edge of the wood, okay? You don't overlap it like traditional because this gets installed right and tight, okay? So let me just go like this a little bit and I'll show you the difference. The other type of vinyl corner is a little bit different. Let's get rid of the extra material here I don't need. There we go. Now, this type of drywall corner is the regular square corner. Okay? So there's two kinds of vinyl. One is one's a square and one's a round. Okay? So Here's the square corner. Okay. And the square corner, the installation is flush to the outside of the corner. And it goes on nice and solid like that. And on the other side, we're actually coming shy, half inch. Okay. So this is to the outside, and this is measured to the inside. It's measured to the width. All right. And the way that these install is simple. Let's go to camera one. Okay, Home Depot carries 3M, corner bead spray adhesive called 61. All right, this is fun. So camera two, we'll just back out a little bit. We'll do both corners at the same time. We're supposed to spray this four to six inches away. All right, and it's kind of purplish. All right, and it's kind of acts like a, like a spray adhesive, like a contact cement, has a wonderful aroma about it. 
So you're supposed to spray the corner bead and the drywall. Okay, that's the secret here. And you got up to 10 minutes to install it. That's the cool part, up to 10 minutes. So you don't have to feel rushed here, okay? It's like working with contact cement. If you've had that experience, you know. You set it up, it gets tacky. You can set it and forget it. Now here's the square bead, all right? We're gonna install it where the square section is. All right, here we go. Press it on, we're done. The round bead, look at the difference in the profiler. Okay, check this out. This is a lot more protruding. This is, this is soft, it's tight, it's round. It's very um, discreet, okay? Now, we'll go to camera one. Here's the deal. If you're gonna use round corners, you're also gonna commit, please do this, do not, do not, do not change this rule. You're gonna to commit to one paint color on both wall surfaces. I've seen so many people trying to go custom color paint with round corners and they're drawing lines on their corner bead. They're using masking tape. The lines are indiscriminate. There's no actual shadow difference from one room to the next. Every hour of the day, the sun moves through the windows. Things look nuts because you got three colors on your wall. Do yourself a favor. If you're gonna go custom color, go with square beads, okay? If you're not going custom color and you got kids and you wanna reduce the risk of damage, Go with the round beads, cut the drywall back, stick that on, go with one paint color. Do yourself a favor, all right? Now, we go to camera two here, Eric, if we can. The way we do this, we use the four-inch knife and we just press it in, okay? That's it. And then we should be able to see... Um, we should be able to see a gap from the, this point to the drywall. And that gets filled with the mud, okay? That's great. Now, we're gonna switch over, go to the other side, and I'm gonna show you the other two corners. I got this crazy camera on a swivel here today. All right, let's see if we can get this to work for us. There's our other corner, beautiful. Now, over here, we have two other kinds of corner. And they're very similar, they're both square. One is drywall, corner bead, traditional, which is all metal, all right? And there's still millions of people installing this wrong. And then the other one is a drywall corner bead that is a newer model, and it is the paper kind. All right, now in both of these situations, you're just like that vinyl outside corner with the square. Anytime you have a square corner, you're finishing your outside as 90 degrees. Okay, or really, really close to it. Any imperfections can be filled with drywall compound, so you're fine. But here's the deal. In this scenario, we have two beads. Okay, there we go. One is metal, right? You've all seen this. And the other one is metal wrapped in paper, okay? And the metal com bead gets installed not with screws. Every time I see a metal corner bead installed with screws, I know I'm dealing with a handyman who doesn't know his job. Okay, here you go. This is what you see in, in the workplace all the time. Somebody comes along, sticks a corner bead on here, gets a screw, and they, they're trying to drive the screw in this big hole here, okay? This hole is not for the screw, all right? This hole is not for the screw. That hole is for the mud. That's for the compound to come in contact with that drywall paper and bond the two things together, okay? Here's how we're supposed to do this. Let me just get a better angle here. Okay. There we go. That is a drywall screw. 
nail, sorry. It's a blue flat head. Look how thin that head is. It's designed, okay, so that you can just stick it up against the outside edge. Not in the hole on the outside edge. Now, I know this might come as a shock, but in Canada, we actually have drywall corner beads with little holes designed for the nail location. All right? And it's like any other fastener. Put one of these in every 16 inches. Perpendicular. Okay. Ugh. Watch this. So that there's nothing but daylight there. Okay. You're not making any contact with the nails or screws on either side. So you have room to fill with compound. Okay. Now, with this one, the paper bead. There is no fastener. This just gets drywall compound. All right. Now, if you're doing a drywall repair, you have the option to take this corner bead and bring it right up to a cut piece of metal and you can install and then you can make a nice finished edge. Okay. So now we're going to go deal with how to put on the compound. But before we do that, here we go. Ah. <laughs> Okay. Oh, my goodness, bud. Here we go. Camera number one, please. There we go. We're going to talk about uh, all-purpose compound. Hey. This is this stuff. All right. This is the bulk of everything you want to use as a DIYer. There's many products out there. This is the bulk. This does all the work. Okay. The only time... You want to use anything like this, which is an easy sand five, is if you're mixing mud in a quick hurry and you need it to dry fast. It's got a hardening compound. Five minutes, five minutes of working time once you mix your mud. Okay? Five. That's it. So, you know, make it sparingly. Now we're gonna make some today. But first I'm gonna show you. Yeah, I'm having a gonna have a camera issue getting in there, aren't I? Let's go like that. That should work. We're gonna take our compound, comes in a bag, throw it in a pail. Okay. And we're gonna add a little water. Okay, about a half a can of Pepsi worth of water. If you buy the big box, Use a whole little mini bottle of water. Get your drill with your mixer blade. Okay, these come in for sale at the Home Depot. This is a regular cheap ass drill. Mixing blade, stick it in there. Go to camera two. All purpose compound comes ready to use, but comes too thick to use. Now, as a homeowner doing DIY renovations, how many of you guys have all seen, they've got um, uh, all over TikTok and, and, and they've got these special machines, they have the commercial guys. <coughs> and they've got the banjo, which is that square box on the end of a stick. They use it to tape all the, put all the mud over the tape. They've got the uh, bazooka, which is a taping stick for inside corners and putting on the flats. They've got all these fancy tools. They've got paper bead, dispensary tape machines that go through the mud and they put the mud on both sides so that the tape is soaking wet and then they can install it really super quick. All of these fancy gizmo for making the product go really, really fast. As homeowners, you don't have access to that equipment. You don't want that equipment. You're not doing a project big enough like a whole house in one day where you need to be that fast. These guys get paid for production and those tools are great, but you're not ever gonna use them. So what you gotta learn how to do is use this. And this, four by 10 and a four inch knife. If you can learn how to use these three tools as a DIYer, you'll be successful. Okay, so we're gonna show you that right now. Once we've mixed up our mud, okay, we're gonna grab 
a little bit and put it on the hock. Okay? Doesn't take much. That's lots of mud. Okay? It's going to be a couple of pounds. It's easy to manage. It's not going to cause you fatigue. It's easy to load up again. All right? So don't go put a mountain of mud on here. It's not necessary. Now, uh huh. Okay, here we go. This is how we do the mud. Okay, we take the mud off the hock with our knife and put it on there like this. All right, and then we're going to apply it to the drywall off the side like that and then snow plow it back towards the corner. Okay, you're gonna just do that until the corner is nice and filled up. All right? That's that simple. You do it on both sides, off the side. You have a lot of control off the side because you don't have to add pressure if you don't want to. And you're not gonna get mud going everywhere. All right, now let's just do this. And then up a little bit more. Okay, we take our corner bead, no special treatment. We're just gonna set it, all right? And then we're gonna go and check, we're gonna measure from the metal edge to the drywall, gonna ensure that we have a gap because we have this ability to roll it one way or the other, okay? You're just simply gonna, on an angle, press that paper into the mud so the extra comes out, all right? Now that's set. <laughs> that's all there is to it. That is now set. All right. Now, with this type of corner bead, that has to, you have to put another little bit on the surface, okay, so it doesn't bubble and clean it off. Now you're perfect. This is done. With the metal bead, you can go on the same day as you put it on and you can fill it up and you can actually do a fill coat up to four inches wide, okay? And if you're in a hurry, you can use quick set mud for this, come back in an hour, and then you can do a six inch run on your same corner bead, all right? Metal can be filled, paper can't, all right? There we go. Now, Let's take a look at this now. We've got a couple more joints to work out. Now while we're here, we've got mud in our hawk. We've done our corners. Let's just talk about real quick taping practices, and then we'll deal with all of the damage that you guys are doing to your drywall, and that'll be great. Um, first of all, paper tape is a must have. This is the bread and butter of this whole industry. Okay, paper, believe it or not. Bonded paper to paper is incredibly strong. All right? And again, it's the same thing. We're going to take our mud on that joint sideways and leave a good bunch of it there. Always working off the side of the knife to apply the mud. We use the wide side of the knife to clean it off. All right? Put a little bit on. Snow plow a little bit, angle up, and flatten it out. That's all you gotta do, okay? And then, uh, we're good for paper. So four feet, eight feet, all right. Gently set it in. You don't have to do anything extravagant here. That's it. I know, that seems almost too crazy, right? Where a lot of people run into problems is they're pressing it in too hard, okay? And what you end up doing is you end up like clearing all of the mud out of behind the paper. You don't wanna do that. You want that mud in there. The mud is the bond, okay? So now you got mud in there. You're gonna come back, a little bit of mud, and you're gonna go over top 
on the side, and you're going to clean it off on the bottom and the top. Get it wet, clean it, clean it, get it wet, clean it, clean it. That's perfect mud bed. See, now what you've got here, now what you've got is you've got a um, nice bit of mud behind your paper and you've got mud on the surface of the paper. So both sides of the paper are wet. Remember the mud machine I was talking about? That mud machine actually puts mud on both sides of the paper because otherwise your paper is going to blister. And then in order to deal with that mess, you've got to cut, cut it out and then fill it back in again. You lose a whole day of production. It'll drive you nuts, okay? Now for the butt joint, very similar thing, right? We're just gonna put on the paper. But what do you see here that's unusual about this butt joint? Right, we're gonna get into repairs now because let's, uh, let's drop this camera down a little bit. Here we go. Yeah, okay. These brown streaks here, you see this? Yeah, this is paper that when the drywall went into the truck, it peeled off, okay? Now, when you're working and you've got damage in your paper, you actually wanna, you can peel it off like that. If it's loose, peel it off, okay? Because if it's loose, then it's not bonded. And you wanna get rid of that. You wanna get rid of loose paper. And here, camera one, here's your solution, okay? This is an oil spray, aerosol spray, oil, Paint kills. Love the stuff. Now, the brown paper is designed to be um, uh, saturated moisture. The, the gray paper, sorry, the brown paper is not. So what you need to do is you need to saturate that brown paper with an oil-based primer that seals it so that you can mud it. All right. Remember the basic drywall concept is this, drywall is designed to get wet, soak up extra moisture, and then release it over time without affecting the interior finished paint job. That's really killer. Key, and what that paint does is it provides you a little bit of layer of protection because when the brown paper is exposed and it gets wet, it actually swells up and blisters right away, okay? So you can't mud over brown paper, you get blisters. You might not see it, because the next day you come down to your basement, you know, hey, the drywall's all nice and dry. Everything looks great. Put on another coat of mud, you go back upstairs. You got your brown paper wet again and it starts to blister, but you're not looking at it. You've left the room. You prime, you do your thing, you're gone, everything's good. You paint. And then while you're painting, because painting is so fast, you go do a second coat. You see the blisters and you've got your first coat of paint on. You're like, what are these blisters? Those blisters are because you didn't prime the brown drywall exposed paper, okay? That's what that is. So stop, realize you have a problem. You see brown paper exposed. You have to seal it before you move forward or you will forever have blisters. And every time it's humid outside, hmm, they're gonna, every time it rains, the wall is gonna blister up on you and it's gonna look like junk, all right? All right, here we go. Home Depot, Kills Original, all right? Red can. Do not confuse it with this one. This is the mold and mildew product, okay? We use this in the bathroom. We actually sprayed it on all the studs in the bathroom where we had mold developing. This provides you protection against the growth of mold. This is just a primer sealer. There's also a black one, black can that's designed for exterior. This is your interior paint and drywall, money in the bank, it's oil-based primer sealer. Period, period, okay? Now, ugh. now this takes about 10 minutes to dry, which is great, because you can go on and do the rest of your basement and come back, right? Nobody really cares if it takes 10 minutes. Same thing with your screws. Here, I'm gonna show you this. All right, we've got a couple of screw holes here we can get a hold of, even more angle. I don't know if that's gonna show up there, Eric. Maybe, maybe not, eh? One and two, 
Yeah, there they are. They're both on the screen now. All right. Don't be this guy who goes all day long. Okay, that takes forever. Load up mud on the side of your knife. Are we looking at the same screw hole here? Oh, I see what's going on. Come on, honey. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Daddy's camera's getting loose. All right, well, we'll just go to the regular one. Use your, off the side of the knife, run up all your screw holes, one motion, okay? One motion off the side of the knife. All right, that's how you fill your screw holes. That'll be super fast. I don't know what's going on with my other camera here, buddy. Should be back with audio. Yeah? Yeah, you're good with audio. Okay, buddy, thanks. Sorry, guys, technical difficulties. <laughs> All right, let's get this out of the way here now. And I'm gonna see if I can tighten that up another day. Now, we wanted to talk about damage, right? And different repairs. That's your basics of installation. So let's talk about the damage. Uh, first of all, we got doorknobs, right? Somebody opened the door and your door stop isn't working and great, okay? We've also got uh, scenarios where people have got a thing screwed to the wall. And can I just suggest that the whole world needs to do this. When you're putting in um, towel bars, okay, they come at 18, 24, 30 inch. None of those are gonna find both studs. The entire industry is designed for failure, okay? So as a builder, you need to put blocking. You need to know where your towel bar is going and put in blocking in your framing in advance, right? Measure it, mark it off, take a picture with your phone, know where it is. But if you buy a house, here's what you get. Somebody goes, oh, towel bar. <laughs> we'll put it right there. No problem, right? Yeah, that's the right spot, Fred. There's your little plug. This stupid thing here, rated for about 50 pounds. That ought to solve that problem. And they put in that little screw and they mount your damn towel bar for you. Then little Jimmy comes along and says, woo, that looks like fun, right? Jumps up there, grabs the towel bar and rips it out of the wall. Great, how in the heck do you fix that, right? Well, there's a couple of different ways to fix holes. You got great little holes like this, or let's say you got a great big hole like this. All right, holy crap! Hey, who was the drunk bum who ran down the stairs and did a header through the wall? There's a few different options. One option is this. You got a little hole. Let's get that four inch knife. I'm gonna show you something really quick here. On the back of a four inch knife, if it's good, it's metal. It should be like rounded, okay? See that? Now, when you got a small hole like this, you take your rounded and you get in there and you just create a bowl in your wall. Something that can be filled, all right? Take your compound, slap that sucker in there, cut it over nice and lightly. That's it, problem solved. You're gonna need two or three coats. Okay, now, I'm gonna try my darndest here to get this bad boy up and running again for some of these other holes. I am inverted, it's like nobody's business. Okay, there we go. Okay, let's deal with a great big one up. Well, let's do the one on the bottom first. Just a doorknob, a simple one. Now, for a doorknob, you got a couple of different options. I think the easiest option for everybody here is gonna be this, because doorknobs are a significant hole. So you need a significant solution. 
So I went out and I bought a brand new roll of mesh tape. And you know what? <clears throat> you think that I'd find the beginning of the roll? <laughs> there we go. We're going to start here and we're going to go until we clean this up. There we go. All right. Now, mesh tape, fiberglass, okay? See the holes? Works a lot like lath and plaster, okay? What you do is you come over here and you take the round edge of your knife and you dent in all your junk there and you slide on your mesh tape. It's a self-adhesive. Use the side of the knife here to tear it off, okay? You don't need 45 pieces of this. This is not 45 pieces of mesh. You want the holes because your job is to now mix some mud, push it through the holes so it's on the outside and on the backside. And when it's dried, it becomes substantial enough to withstand basic traffic like painting the wall, okay? That's basic traffic. People shouldn't be putting their head through your wall. That doesn't count, right? So in that scenario, we've got this number five. Here we go. So, here's how you mix the number five. You're doing just a little patch. You don't need a lot of this stuff, right? Just a little bundle, creating a little bit of a volcano. Now, you take your handle and you make a bit of a volcano with the handle. Okay, you're gonna try to dam that in there, all right, so that you can put in some water and it's not gonna be all making a mess everywhere. Now here I am doing this live on television, on YouTube. I'm in my finished living room. I'm about to sell this place. And I'm doing this to teach you how to do this live. Hopefully I don't make one hell of a mess. Take some water, you pour it in the middle. Just enough so that you're about, I don't know, halfway up the ridge. Dexterity, don't fail me now. Okay, wow, here we go. This is crazy, I'm moving around way too much to be honest with you. Now, you take a little bit off the side, you sprinkle it on the top. You'll notice it doesn't suck it up right away. This compound is not designed to like just melt in the water. It sits on it, slowly sucking it up. Okay, all right, it's a lot like a real volcano. Have you ever seen that video where the kid throws the rock in from the edge of the volcano and it looks dormant? As soon as he throws in the rock, he breaks through the slag and all of a sudden everything starts falling apart and melting and the thing looks like it's ready to blow up. That's what this is. This is crazy time. All right, now we're slow. We're taking our time here. Taking your time. Stealing from the side. Robbing Peter to pay Paul. That's what this is all about. Okay. All right. Force it. Force it to jiggle in with each other. Now start to work the middle a little bit. Try to make a bit of a mud pie out of it. Ooh, here we go. All right, there we are. Okay. All right, and then we're gonna start folding it in. It's a lot like baking, all right? For all you women out there, we love to bake, guys too, but let me, let's just face it. Ah, oh, where I grew up. Girls learned the kitchen and men were learned the workshop. Glad that's not the way it is anymore, but if you in the baking world, here we go. See that? Look how thick and that's making your own mud. Now remember I said this stuff had five minute working time. All right. Your job is to make this as silky smooth as possible so that you don't have to sand it once it's dry. Okay? So you're gonna work it with the tip of that knife, doing circles. Okay. There we go. Now, we got our mesh, we got our mud, all right? We're not gonna just put it on like a baby, all right? We're not here to just put a nice little feather coat and say, okay, it's done. We wanna push that crap through the other side. Okay, we're gonna force it in. We wanna force it in, all right? We wanna just push it in, push it in. I'm gonna use almost all the mud that I just made on this one little patch. I wanna push this point through to you guys. This patch works when you push the mud through, okay? Oh. 
There you go. Almost all that mud. One little, one, one, one little hole. Okay, because on the back side, it's pushed through. Now I got a half inch thick of quick set hardening mud. That patch is nice and strong. The other thing you can do with this stuff while you're at it. So when you have a broken corner, right? Let's say you installed your drywall and you broke your corner while you're at it. Same thing, right? Take your five minute when you're starting. Go over that broken corner, fill it up, okay? Fill up all your gaps before you mud. You take your broken corner, okay? Uh, grab yourself a little bit of paper tape, all right? And you go over top of your broken corner, okay? Put a little bit of mud there. All right, there you go. That's how you fix things. Now, let's move on to this great big giant hole because this is gonna be a little bit fun. The great big giant hole, okay? Consistency is thick, all right? It's Dairy Queen thick, okay? Dairy Queen thick, all right? <laughs> Eric got it. All right, here we go. Ah, oh, that's awesome. Okay, now, um, you can't just put mud in that hole. I mean, you're, you're screwed, right? So, we got another step of preparation here. Ah. In the scenario where you got a big hole like this, I'm gonna try to lift this camera up to the next level again. Ah, see if we can get a better shot down the road here. Okay. There we go, let's get it right in the middle. Bam. All right. Uh, uh, we got another sheet of drywall. Uh, now, you are not gonna find a sheet of drywall at Home Depot that makes any sense for you to fix that hole. What you will find is something that's about two foot by two foot, okay? Let me just cut this off. Remember, we're not cutting the whole sheet of drywall, we're just cutting the paper, right? Okay, there we go. Two foot by two foot, Home Depot special, 10 bucks, right? Or you can get the whole four by eight for 12. <laughs> but if you want the two by two foot, which fits in your back seat of your car, so you can fix dumbass hole in your wall from the party the night before, Here's what you do. Take this bad boy, and you're gonna kind of draw it out, all right? I'm gonna use a black marker as you can figure this out. Draw this out, feel back here. The damage is all the way up to here. On the back side, it's kind of like, how shall I say it? Oh, I know. Um, it's like a hollow point round, okay? Hollow point bullet. The hole is bigger on the back than it is on the front, all right? So you wanna just draw this out. That's about the size of your hole, okay? Now, you got two options. A, you can cut this hole, and then you can cut a piece of drywall to fit the hole. Or, what's easier, is you take a piece of drywall, okay, and you kinda score it like that, and you score it like that. Here, let's go to camera one. And then you cut the piece of drywall first, okay? Now I got the square that fits the integrity of this drywall. I'm gonna hold it up to that wall, and I'm gonna draw it out again. Use a pencil though, for the love of God, because you're gonna wanna paint this thing. Oh, that's pretty close, not bad, eh? Now, you take your keyhole saw. Boom, drywall keyhole saw. $8 at the hardware store, lifesaver, okay? Put it in the corner, all right? Can't plunge through, there's stud there. Good news, go to the middle. All right, here we go. Cut just a little bit bigger than your mark. If you cut too exact, 
You're going to spend all day long fussing around, okay? When it's over, said, just take out your utility knife. This is an Olfa knife. Every DIYer in the world should own one of these things. It's adjustable. they got snap-on blades. You can close it. You can open it. You can make it into a sword. You know, it's good for home defense as well. Here we go. You cut it. Stick it all the way in. Go right down to the paper if you have to. Now, at this point, the drywall that you cut should fit inside that hole, and it does. But it's not good enough, is it? We need another, another step here for this problem. So, ah, this is where homeowners should have a little bit of strapping. Now, if you go to the store, you can buy a one by three strapping. It's about three bucks. Grab your skill saw. Hold that up against the wall, okay? What you're looking for here, and I'm gonna go through the science because this is actually pretty scientific, all right? Wood backing. You wanna have a screw here and a screw here. A screw here and a screw here. You wanna do it on both sides, okay? So we're gonna make two of these things, all right? And the reason you wanna have these two screws on both sides is because when you, when you take a look at the science of drywall plugs, a good drywall plug can really hold the back of the drywall really well. It has some sort of a feature that expands in behind the drywall. Those plugs were rated up to 120 pounds for an average wood screw. So if we create a backing behind this on all four corners where we've got two screws, and then we're going to be generous with ourselves and call it 120 pounds, even though it's two and not one screw, right, then whatever we attach to it is now stronger than anything rated to attach to drywall ever. So we don't have to worry about, is that strong enough? Do I need plywood? Do I need to call a structural engineer? No, it's just drywall. So we cut it and we install it, okay? Really simple. Now, depending on the size of your hole, here's a trick for you. Take a drywall screw in the middle, create a handle, okay? Now, do yourself a favor. Start all your screws first, okay? Like honestly, you're gonna need three hands to do this. So, if you put your screws in the drywall first, and then you go lift your little strapping in there, you won't need another hand. You're gonna have one hand holding the drill, one hand holding the strapping, and one hand fiddling for a screw. Last time I checked, that's at least you plus somebody with a half a brain attached to their head. And if you're working by yourself, you don't have time for that noise. So now you can hold the screw. You can reach into your wall, right? Set the screw, boom. Pull on the screw. Set the depth nice and gentle. Okay, don't go too deep. You don't want to break the surface of the paper. If you break the surface of the paper, grab another screw, for the love of God, put an inch higher, and drive that one in, okay? It's that simple. Now, ugh. do that for the other one as well, all right? Now, if there's insulation and vapor barrier in there, it's a little trickier, but everything will move out of the way. Trust me, there's lots of room in there. Better to go a little um, underrepresented in the beginning. Wait till everything's attached, okay? Get rid of your extra screw. And then you can go back, make sure it's perfect. Until we're not hearing, oh, see that? Click, not done. Perfect. Perfect every time. Now, now we can take that little piece of drywall that we cut. Where the heck is it? There it is. We just place it in here, okay? Split the difference on the gap. How big the gap is here doesn't matter. This is not rocket science, folks. This is just drywall. All right, everybody repeat with me after home. at home, okay? It's just drywall. You don't have to be intimidated by the stuff. It's not rocket science. The truth of it is, this is such a miracle product, it's really hard to screw it up. Now, you got all kinds of options with this. 
If you're in a hurry, you use the mesh tape. Use the five minute mud. Come back in the 30 minutes and do another coat of mesh, mesh mud. Or we can just take regular all purpose compound, right? And I'm gonna recommend this for most of our homeowners, especially during football season, because this is something you can fix on a Saturday morning. Okay, off the side of the knife, push it in those holes, okay? There we go. That's starting to look like a patch, right? Here we go. Fill it in. Make sure we got a little bit of compound on both sides. Of okay, grab your paper. Oh, I wish I had somewhere to put this. All right. Ugh. Grab your paper, okay? Now, this paper comes with a fold. Always put the, the peak of the fold on the back side. You see when you fold it, it always makes a ridge for an inside corner. Put the ridge to the back side, okay? You put mud on the face and then you go over top of it, okay? Go wide, mud on the face, and then go over top of it. And the reason I talk about this for football season is the following. This particular patch in this environment <laughs> takes about 10 minutes, but then it takes 24 hours to dry, you see? So this is, this is you being a good husband, patching up your house, taking care of your property. But baby, I got to come back tomorrow for the next coat. Jeff said so. And then you got time for the game. You're welcome, gentlemen. All right, so there we go. Now, let's just pretend it's tomorrow. You take your 4 by 10, boom, 4 by 12, 4 by 14, whatever, okay? The big one, all right? And, yes, if you want one of these, it's called the Hawk Mate. All right, bam, get it, Hawk Mate. You can get it online. I don't know if we got a link for it or not. I go to my, I always shop for my drywall tools at a drywall supplier for wholesale commercial guys. They have the best tools in the world there. Like DeWalt has really good screw guns there and they sell a, a, a Tonka toy version of it at the Home Depot. Be careful, not all tools that say DeWalt are the best tools DeWalt makes. But anyway, here's the deal. With this situation, you wanna treat it like a butt joint, okay? You wanna go mud, 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 okay? And then you go, a little tighter in the middle, clean it off. Pressure on the outside, pressure on the other outside. That's day two, okay? And then you let that dry. I know, it looks not too bad considering it's all on the same day. <laughs> Listen, the, the camera lies, all right? Almost every drywall guy you see on TV, they're all learning that uh, the camera lies and they can get away with bloody murder and they can make really fun looking videos but they're not helpful at all. That's helpful. Second coat, if you use too much mud, it's okay, you can sand. And then you can apply the third coat. But you don't have to sand between coats if you don't use too much mud. The way you know you use too much mud is if it come over here when it's dry and you put your knife on it and it rocks. <laughs> then you wanna sand back until your knife isn't rocking or you start to expose the paper. If you expose the paper, just simply start the next coat way over here, okay? And then you stretch it out, and you stretch it out, and you stretch it out, okay? That's how you do it. One more trick about drywall for all of the rookies out here. If you're having a hard time with your drywall and you're sanding because you think you got too much mud on and you're always exposing your tape, do this. Do your mud, sand. Ah, help me, ah, I found my tape. Oh, darn, I exposed the tape again. Now it's gonna look like junk when I paint. Go and get your primer for your drywall, your PVA drywall primer. Now that you've sanded, prime your wall. Then you come back and do another coat of mud over top of the primer, okay? Like this, okay? The next time you sand, I guarantee you, you can't sand through the primer to the paper tape and you will get a great result, all right? It's an extra step. But if you're struggling, that'll help you out a lot, okay? Now, that's the basic gist of it. Holy cow, it's seven minutes after six. 
I haven't even answered a single question yet. Oh, Eric, we got 15 minutes. We can do that. Do some questions. What do you think, buddy? Throw them up there if that's a yes. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. All right. Great to hear. Appreciate it, buddy. All right. Uh, hi, Elsa. Cheers. Hey, guys, uh, just for a reminder, if you haven't become a member of our channel yet, you should. Okay. I'm not just a homeowner who's trying stuff and throwing videos on the internet. Been in the trades for 35 years. Um, we have an amazing new project. We're going to start filming this spring. Can't tell you the details because I'm not allowed yet, but I'm just letting you know. This channel is just getting started. We got the greatest DIY membership program on the planet. We got a few thousand people helping each other out, sharing information, which is really important because I'm from Canada, down in Florida right now, but trying to expand my understanding. Eric, let's get into some questions here. Okay. Is there a time, oh, Flora Varga from Hamilton. Is there a time where you don't have to use tape when mudding something? Hmm. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, anytime you've got two pieces of material, you've got to use tape. That prevents cracks, okay? Whether it's mesh or paper, it doesn't make a difference, but you've got to use the paper tape in order to prevent the crack from going. Things can move independently, okay? Even expansion contraction. Uh, you'll get a water leak on one side of the basement, and that drywall will swell up and fill up full of water. And if that bud joint isn't taped and it's just, just mudded and painted, the dry will expand and then it'll shrink again and you'll end up with a crack line. And you'll be like, ah, oh, darn, I wish I just taped it. Yeah, so no, you always have to tape. Anytime you're going sheet to sheet or um, plane to plane, like wall to ceiling or wall to wall, you've always got to have a paper joint. All right, great question. Joe K, another member, can you touch on hanging drywall vertical versus horizontal? Yeah, it's basically the same thing. The trick is this, if you frame perfectly, so that the center of every stud is four feet or 16 inch on center, then you can go vertical, all right? Now here's the deal. When you do vertical joints, every four feet, you have an eight foot joint from eight feet tall right to the floor. Now, let me just show you what that looks like, okay? So now I got a joint, every four feet I gotta go and bend down and then do the joint, okay? Whoop. Or every four feet, I got to go like this. All right? Vertical joints actually create a lot more work. There's a lot more paper tape being used. Now, you don't have to do with butt joints, okay? But butt joints aren't that tricky. It's just every 12 feet or so. You may have two or three of them in an entire basement. I would rather take butt joints over vertical any day because I don't have to get up and down off a ladder. I don't have to bend over to the ground. And at 53, on a ladder all the way to the ground on one joint, just to save the odd butt joint, when I can do 90% of the work walking down the wall like this, you can forget it. I'm not doing vertical. <laughs> I understand the, the lure of avoiding a butt joint, but it's easier to learn how to do a butt joint than do all of that vertical taping. All right, next question. Ah, Jason Shirley, another member of the channel. Cheers, Jason. Uh, what can I do if drywall done previously doesn't match up with new drywall? Example, the old drywall sticks out further than the new drywall. In a lot of cases, if you're doing a patch or repair, you've got to take into consideration the, the drywall thickness plus the compound. What you can do is you can buy 5 8 drywall. And so when you apply that drywall, you're automatically the same thickness as the previous drywall plus compound. Or drywall plus plaster. A lot of older homes. They do a drywall half inch plus one, two, or three coats of plaster. So you got to use a combination of different thicknesses of drywall to get flush before you tape. Or your first coat of mud is actually a fill coat just to get flush with the surface of the existing wall. So don't be afraid to grab two layers of three eighths or a quarter and a half or a five eighths or a combination of whatever. Remember, drywall comes in quarter inch, three eighths, half inch, and five eighths. So you got a lot of options to play with there. Every eighth combination you can build into your assembly wall, even if it's two layers of drywall, there's no code requirement that says you can't do that. In fact, it's normal in commercial construction to use two coats of drywall to get the proper fire rating to protect our steel posts so the buildings don't fall down. So it's not uncommon, it's completely standard. Build until you're flush and then tape and then fan out the mud to eliminate the bump. Cheers. <laughs> 
<laughs> wow, I'm not even going to get there. But basket RV, which tape to use from drywall to concrete board in the bathroom? <laughs> okay, use the alkaline um, tape for concrete board, okay, in that scenario. And then use a quick set mud. All right, so it's a fiberglass mesh tape. It'll come green or blue or depending on the brand, all right? But use that stuff and then use a quick set five or 10 or 15 minute mud or Jura Bond, okay, which is super quick, all right? And that's the that's gonna be the right formula for you. Cheers, buddy. Oh, wow, all right, I took down a wire shelf in a closet. Ooh, that's a bugger, there's so many holes. Yeah, a bunch of holes in the drywall now. Is there an easy, quick way to repair the holes? To make it more fun, the drywall has an orange peel finish. <laughs> yeah, all right, so you got a bunch of these, right? All right, take your four inch knife. Grab that little round thing on the bottom of your knife, okay? And create a bowl with each one of those holes. All right. If it isn't broken all the way through, or if the hole is less than a half an inch in diameter, just fill it with mud. No tape necessary, okay? It's going to take you about three coats because it shrinks as it dries, but three coats of that and you're going to be good to go, all right? Cheers. Do not worry about anything smaller than a half an inch hole. All right. Took down, that was Charles. Cheers, Charles. Uh, we're gonna have four minutes left. Let's knock this off real quick. We've got, Chris is asking a question here about the best size thickness for ceiling drywall. And that all depends, Chris, on what kind of sound proofing you wanna to put in into your, your installation. Traditional um, residential housing is half inch, non fiberglass, no fire code rating at all, okay? It's ultra light drywall, half inch. Now, when we get into adding sound proofing or sound resistance layers in between different floors, we get into insulation, we get into using five eighths or two layers of five eighths. There's a lot of different assembly options, but your minimum code requirement is half inch ultra light drywall. Cheers. Okay, uh, Justy Campa, another member, thanks. We'll strap in the ceiling off for similar sound vibration dampening effect as the expensive resilient channel. Already doing the two layer insulation and two layers of 5 8 drywall, thank you. Okay, it's gonna be really close because with that much of an assembly, you're probably in around the 60 to 65 STC rating. So um, the resilient channel versus strapping is gonna be like a, a 0.2 to 0.3, one or the other. Resilient channel is always a little better, but it's such a small difference, right? It's like driving 75 miles an hour or 76. Yeah, you're gonna pass the guy in 20 minutes, but are you really going that much faster as soon as you hit the next red light? So it really, don't even worry about it. Um, whatever you're more comfortable with. If you, if you haven't worked with a resilient channel before, you're gonna find that you have to use special screws. They can be a little maddening to work with. They're self-tapping. Um, if you don't have a drywall screw gun, you're probably better to stick to wood strapping. It's easier to work with. Boom. Uh, Rach, <laughs> I can't even, I don't even know what that says. Ratchaby, I don't know. <laughs> How do you know where to safely cut into a damaged wall to fix it properly, to avoid electrical and plumbing, etc.? Great question. All right, here's the deal. Let's see if I got my marker here. I can make a, make a note. There it is. Okay, ah. let's go to camera two. Okay. Here's our half inch drywall, cross section, okay? Here's a stud. The stud is three and a half inches. Is that showing up on that camera okay? Let's get in there a little bit tighter. Alrighty, well, there we go. Stud's three and a half inches. Yeah, there we go, okay. By code, electrical and plumbing. If this is the drywall, that's the beginning of the stud, has to be run a minimum of one and a half inches from the face of the wall, okay? Now, if it's any closer than that, they have to put a steel plate in front of whatever's passing through the stud. So, when you're cutting into your wall and you're using a saw like this, oh, I'm sorry. One of the things you can do just take your saw, measure down an inch and a half plus half inch drywall and put some blue tape on it. 
okay? Once you've got your tape on there, as you're going in and out of the wall, you just make sure your tape doesn't disappear behind the drywall and you will be free and clear of almost every protrusion out there. Standard practice is to drill through the middle of the stud. It's almost normal. Now, the other way you can do it is when you're cutting, instead of cutting like this, straight into the wall, okay? Cut like this. Okay, so here's my black mark. I'm only gonna go in the wall on an inch. And you can cut on an angle. So now you're cutting like this through the drywall. All right, and you're only going in maybe half an inch. All right, that's a much safer way to do it if you're concerned about what's behind the wall, especially if you didn't build the place, right? All right, great question. Uh, if you were gonna cover drywall with tile, like in a bathroom slash kitchen, do you have to do anything before the drywall before? Yeah, kid, you wanna always do the primer sealer, okay? Um, if you're in a bathroom and you're not in a wet area, you don't have to use thin set. You can use a, like a mastic, but Mastic is a water-based product, and so the water will just jump into the drywall long before it really finishes bonding and curing. So you always got to put the drywall sealer on. It's a PVA drywall primer. Drywall must be primed before any application ever. That goes for tile, mastic, thin set, stipple, textured spray. The entire industry doesn't prime first. They're supposed to read the bag, guys, right? That's an improper installation. Millions of people can be sued every day for being stupid because they don't prime their drywall first. As a homeowner, as long as you prime your drywall first, you're following best practice no matter what application you're gonna do. So never skip that step. Cheers. Difference engine. If nails are popping out from the drywall was hung, would you push the nail in or pull the nail out to patch it? That is great. Let's do this. All right. Ah. So. We put in a screw. It helps if I find the stud. Here, let me just show you real quick. Actually, we'll do it over here. This will work easier because I've already got it already on the board. All right, yeah. Okay, so there's a stud here. If you go too deep, vibrations cause that to pop and the mud that fills that hole stick out. All right, here's how you fix it. All right, if it's a nail and it's sticking out, it'll look something like this, okay? What happens is sometimes it'll be sticking out like this. And what happens in sometimes in construction, sometimes in construction, you've got a stud and they screwed it on and it was soaking wet, okay? The wall dries out and then the wood warps, all right? And everything's fine until somebody bumps up against the drywall and it pops that screw out. Now, what you do to fix it, whether it's a screw or a nail, is you take your hammer, you sink that nice and flush, and then you take another screw one inch below it, and you just drive it just until it's just below the surface. And if you're comfortable with that, great. If you're not comfortable with that, feel free to take another one and drive a second one. Because two screws is five times stronger than one, okay? So if you've got a weird bow and you're like, I don't want this to happen again, I'm gonna go do this, I'm gonna add mud, I wanna sand, I wanna prime, I wanna paint, I don't wanna see that hole ever again. Double screw, every time. And you will not ever, 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 ever have a problem again. Cheers. <laughs> um, if you do have that problem again, you've got bigger problems and just a little bit of moisture in the wall from construction. <laughs> it might be foundational. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's take two more questions, then we'll call it there. Um, if you've got other questions, guys, feel free to put them in the comment section after the feed is over, and I'll jump in and do it the best I can. Or join the membership and ask me your questions. If you're dealing with problems with your drywall, happy to help you out. Mitch wants to know, how do you recommend hanging drywall around an already installed fuse box? Okay. Great question. All right, Mitch, fuse box, eh? Um, let's deal with this. Let's say that your fuse box is like here, okay? And I wanna put drywall around it. You measure your drywall within a quarter inch of the outside your fuse box, okay? And you remember that paper tape we did the outside corner with, 
all right? They make something that looks like this, okay? It's half inch thick, just like your drywall, with a two inch metal paper. And what you do is you just cut it larger than you need, you put the mud around the edge, and you put that L trim up against your fuse box, and then you use your knife to mud it in nice and smooth. You get a perfectly sexy look, all right? And it doesn't, you don't have to struggle with it, okay? Cheers, buddy. All right, one more question. And or cast one, two, three. What about two pieces of drywall coming together in a corner? Seems harder to seal with compound in a corner than a flat space. Maybe a demo on corners next time. Yeah, I can appreciate that. Here's the thing. Here's your knife, okay? This is 89 degrees, okay? The way you run a corner is really simple. You've got your two pieces of paper, you put them compound on both, you clean them both, you wet them both, and you clean it all up. And then when you're done, you do off this side, you add compound to one side of the corner, and you run it down and you clean it with that 90 degrees at the same time. I've got videos A to Z, how to be a drywall expert, okay? It's a whole trade school. But when you do that one side with a four inch, then the next day, you take it a five inch on the same side, and you do that same thing, just a thinner, little thinner and a little wider, and then you wanna give it 24 hours, throw a fan on it even, especially in basements because there's higher humidity levels and air doesn't circulate enough to really dry all the corners consistently. Then you can come back and go on the other side once the mud is hard. Like you should be able to knock it and not put a dent in it. Then you can do the four inch and then the five inch on the other side. That's how you do it. It's a four coat application. But the first coat can be done the same day as you do your paper coat, but you put your paper on both sides, you wet both sides, you clean both sides, and then you apply one bead on one side only. Okay, the whole series is in that A to Z video. I would recommend you go try that out. Guys, next time we're here, we got a live show in a couple weeks. We're gonna put the date up. It's Tuesday, the January the 30th, because I'm in Chicago at a trade show next week. We're gonna have all this taping done, okay? And we're gonna be testing out four paints, two from Lowe's, two from Home Depot. They're both on the shelf. They're both the bottom of the barrel as far as price point. The question is, are these guys selling crap just to entice you to spend a lot of money after being disappointed? Or is it possible that the lower price point paint points that are out there, the lower price paints, seashells, seashells, I mean, is it possible that that cheap paint is actually decent stuff? We're gonna find out together. We're gonna try all four of these out. We're gonna continue our experiment into the marketplace and find out where's the good value, right? Because not every homeowner wants $100 a gallon paint. Sometimes, baby, you just need to change the color and let the kid wreck it again for the next five years. So maybe 30 bucks is good enough. Is it possible that you can get good coverage and a decent finish? We'll find out on the 30th. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. Join us then. It's going to be a lot of fun. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, to all our members, Sandy, uh, great to see you again. Love you. Appreciate you. You guys make this DIY community what it is. It's amazing. And I think it's awesome to be a part of it. Thank you for letting me be a part of it. I just, I'm loving you guys. And to everybody else watching, this, hopefully you learned something today that's useful. That's the goal of this channel, to help DIYers up their game so you can get professional results, return equity in your renovation projects so that you can increase your personal wealth in the place where you live. Because you know what? When your house goes up in value, you don't pay income tax if it's your prisoner of residence. So you get paid twice as much as you think you are. Cheers. Till next time.